so uh, it's me. It's me standing in the need. In the need. Um, yeah, just sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Uh, I would like to say that um, I'm extremely excited to be here, but I'm not. Just want to be honest with you. Um, give an honor to the Lord for allowing this to be. Amen. 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 Um, for those of you that really don't care for how I preach, this is your fault. You stressed your pastor out so much, you got to go on a six year sabbatical, so you got to. <laughs> it's your fault. Amen. Um, I just wanted a disclaimer that when I read the word of God, to me it's not somber and it's not depressing, so I'm going to crack a few jokes. Amen. The word of God is really good. It's got some juicy stuff in it. It's funny. It's like, oh my goodness, did she just do that? Like, it's a lot of things in there, so forgive me in advance if a lot of these things kind of, you know, get you a little flustered. I'm sorry. Um, I want to praise the Lord for my husband. Amen. So failed me and that's why I'm up here. So I just want to publicly acknowledge that I still love you. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, I wanted to do something different. I want to honor the shepherds of the house, First Lady and Pastor Johnson. God bless you all. Love you all. I said this last time, but they have been put up with a lot for me. So the fact that they let me stay here says that God is gracious. <laughs> I won't tell y'all stories. Anyway, um, I want to do something different. When I call your name, can you please stand up? Uh, Sister Rita Johnson. Sister Matara Johnson. Um, Sister Wendy. Um, I had a list and I forgot my list. Uh, that Sister Mary's not here. Sister Valerie. Auntie Bonnie. Uh-uh, look at your face. You look like, what did I do? Um, a lot of times we get up here and we say, you know what, praise the Lord for the leaders and the shepherds and all these esteemed people. I praise God for each one of you because I watch you all. And there's more, but I just want to say I watch you all. And each of you give me something. Each of you bless me with something. And you probably don't even know. You probably don't even think what you're doing is major enough to be applauded or praised or worthy of some type of accolade, but I just want to say I see you and I appreciate what you do and who you are because it's a testament and an example to me of how to do this thing the right way. From your strength, your courage, for your secret fire that you got, from your quiet storms, your graciousness, your generosity, and your unconditional love. I just want to say to you guys, I love you. And I just want to say thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I acknowledge you. You are a part of my unsung hero list. And I just want to publicly acknowledge you and say I love you. And thank you for all that you do. Love you. Okay, I said all y'all. So now that I acknowledge you, y'all gonna help me like, woo, praise the Lord when I preach and stuff. You know, get everybody in your row together. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Guess we're gonna do this, huh? All right. So uh, we're gonna come out of 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a lot of scripture. So we only gonna read a couple and then, oh my goodness, I got a cup of juice. What's it in here? Oh, I can't touch it. That's like Deacon John. You can't touch nothing. You can't do nothing in your own church. It's like, never mind. Sorry. Second Kings chapter four, verses eight through thirty-seven. But we're not gonna read that. I promise you. I'm not gonna do y'all like that. If you can stand for the reading of the word, I'm gonna be coming out of the King James version. When you have it, say, "I got it." Now, if you ain't got it, say, hold on, man. No, you're supposed to say, hold on, man. Thank you so much. Whoo, y'all done messed up putting me up there. I don't know why. Everybody got it? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Second Kings 4, verse 8. And it says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed 
to Shunem, where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. Thither, that's the word. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto, unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. I believe she's a black lady. I'll tell you all later why. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. That's a little shade. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door, and he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. 17. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha has said unto her, according to the time of life. We're going to stop there. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity, Father, this divine moment, Lord God, where heaven, Lord God, and destiny meet. We thank you, Lord God, for your people. We thank you for the breakthrough that happened today, Lord God. Father, let this word just be icing on the cake, Father, and allow, Father, for transformation to happen in the hearts of your people. Let this word sink in, Lord God, and be on good ground, and allow it to take root, Father, that it bless somebody in the house. In Jesus' name, have your way, Father, your will, not mine. Do as you see fit, Lord God, and thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, everybody say Amen. 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 All right, you may be seated. So as a title for uh, this sermon, I'm going to call it Losing to Win. Losing to Win. All right. All right. Okay. So um, recently I went to a basketball game and uh, a loved one of mine was playing and we were all in the stands and we were rooting and we were, you know, you go to sporting events. I got to be competitive people in the house. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Like real competitive. Yes. So we're in the stands and we're rooting and, you know, we're yelling and we're screaming and before you know it, you feel like you're on the field. You feel like you're on the court. You feel like you're in the game. That's how competitive you are. Like, if you could suit up, you would take it. You would go down there with these young kids, even though you old as you don't know what, and get down there and think you could do something. There's a competitiveness inside of us, right? The problem with being competitive is, I don't know about you all, but I can't stand to lose. Amen. Amen. I am the worst loser in history of losing. I'm not just sore, I'm an ugly loser. Like it's bad, it's so bad. And people try to console you and it's like it's probably best that you don't even try. Because I'm just that upset that I lost. Losing to me is like your worst day times 10. It's like you get the joy juice just punched out of you. It's like you just, you just upset at everything. You mad at everybody. Somebody walk by and say good morning, whatever. You know what I mean? You just snapping at people, you mad. Hey, you having a good day? No. Like it, it's one of those things where when you lose, you feel some kind of way, right? Amen. Do I got anybody that does not like losing in the house? Is that, a, it's just me or? Okay, talk to me young man, thank you. You play football too? Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So losing is a universal issue. You don't believe me? Let's go to some music. I like music and movies, so. Teddy said, taking the bumps and the bruises of all the things of a two-time loser. <laughs> Trying to hold on, but faith is gone. It's just another sad song. And then what did he say? I think I better. Come on, I'm gonna stop playing with him. Y'all gonna stop acting fake in here, okay? Y'all gonna, come on, y'all gonna stop tripping. Okay, so you don't like Teddy. You wasn't into Teddy. Gladys said it better. She said he kept dreaming that someday he'd be a star. Yeah. But he sure found out the hard way that dreams, dreams don't always come true. So he pawned all his hopes and he even sold his old car. 
He bought a one-way ticket to the life he once knew. Oh, yes, he did. He said he would be leaving. Leaving? On that midnight train, where did he go? Georgia. Because he lost. You know my favorite part of that song is, leaving on the midnight train in Georgia. Woo-hoo! There we go. We're on the same page. We hear it. I love it. So... Absolutely sucks. Can we agree? Yes. yes. Losing is sometimes or something that can be devastating. It can be a very detrimental and critical experience that changes you. Over time, the consistent practice of losing can be downright crippling. Think about it. We've all lost something or someone. We're going to have some class participation. Y'all not just going to sit there and watch me today. When I call this losing thing out, I want you to stand up if you experienced it, okay? If you've lost money, stand up. Now, I ain't going to say how you lost it. We ain't talking about gambling. That ain't my business, okay? If you've lost love, y'all lost a lot of money in here. <laughs> we should be rich. What is going on? If you've lost love, stand up. If you've lost friends, friendship, stand up. If you've lost trust and or respect, stand up. If you've lost jobs, I lost a whole bunch of jobs. <laughs> if you... <laughs> If you've lost relatives, parents, siblings, spouses, stand up. Now, lastly, if you found yourself losing yourself, stand up. Mm -hmm. All right, y'all can sit down. Thank y'all. I appreciate y'all. I know you're asking, DJ Angie Fizzle? That's my radio name, by the way. How could I actually lose myself? How on earth is that possible? I'm still here, I'm functioning, my breath stank in the morning still, I'm standing up, I got a wipe and all of that. The truth is, some of us attach a piece of ourselves to the thing we lost, and once they left, so did we. Mm -hmm. You lost something, maybe your zeal for life, your ambition to start again, in some cases, your faith. For some of us, in the area that we lost, we refuse to dream again. We defy the thought of a second chance and we simply tell God, no thank you. Bury it and continue to live in it every single day. By show of hands, how many of you have dreams or goals that don't, you don't pray for out of fear you'll never see it happen? Mm-hmm. It's hard. It's not easy. The good thing is this story of the Shunammite woman shows us what to do. We're in good company. We, we gonna get past this. Amen? Okay. So grab your carry-ons, all your personal bags. We're taking a trip, people. Are we ready? Woo! We're traveling back to the grand city of Shunem. Y'all ain't never been ahead. So stop playing. Shunem is a city located in Israel between Galilee and Samaria. We know those cities, don't we? It's one of the cities allotted to the tribe of Issachar, a northern kingdom of Israel, and is the very place the Philistines camped when engaging in war against Saul. We remember the story. Saul was going to battle. He was scared out of his mind. He was like, Lord, help me with this battle. And the Lord ghosted him. The Lord didn't even respond because he was so evil and in his sin. So he said, I'm going to hire me a medium. I'm going to go to that tarot card reader. And I'm going to see if she can get my man Samuel to come talk to me. This is the city where all of this went down. Now, we have a main character by the name of Elisha. We learned about him earlier this month from my baby daddy. Elisha is the muscle in this story. He is the prophet. If we recall a few weeks back, we learned of his new start as Elijah's mentee and eventual mantle holder. He's the guy that miraculously cured the water with his salt. He was able to help the widow who was broke and her kids was about to be slaves to take over the, the debt. He healed the Syrian general by the name of Naaman and he did a whole lot. He was that dude as the chosen mouthpiece of God during this era. Elisha traveled a great deal through the town of Shunem on his task to warn Israel of their misconduct. And this is where our story begins. So he has a partner in the story, the Shunammite woman. Our heroine is an unnamed woman in this town who is prominent, she is wealthy, and she has some influence. She a boss. A married and childless resident, the Bible called her great. I want you to put a pen in this. She is nameless, right? 
God does not need you to be famous among people in order to consider you great. Uh -huh. I believe her name is named for a reason because we can put our name in there. Uh huh. Okay. All right. All right. Seemingly, this woman really had it going on. She had a wealthy husband. She had, you know, a sugar daddy. She had a dope house. She had huge land, servants, cattle, all the things that we probably would check off our list for a happy life with. Uh -huh, come on, stop playing. It's notable to highlight that based on her wealth, she had a stature that was in common, though. We know how it is that when people have money, they have power. And not just new money, but she had that old money. That ugly money, the ashy green kind, the ugly one, like it's been around a long time. And we know people who have had money for a while, they know so high up, they can't see nothing. But this wasn't our woman here. This wasn't our Shunammite woman. So, this boss lady had been different. She was a true believer of the Lord. She was a follower of the Lord. She was of a different breed, and she was black, like I mentioned, at least I think so. She had a humility and character about her that the Bible couldn't help but to call great, and it wasn't because of her earthly possessions. Amen? So it was in this disposition that she urged the man of God to come by on his travels and dine. Lysha coming through. She like, come get you a plate. Verse 8 says she constrained him to come in and eat some bread when he visited. Typically, prophets of that day were servants of the land. They had to pretty much fend for themselves. And oftentimes they were enemies of the state. Why? Because they spoke against the government. When the kings were sinning, they weren't popular because they went in and said, you know, you're wrong. Whether it was a hundred prophets of Baal behind them or not, they still flat-footed and said, God said it. So they weren't necessarily used to having hospitable offerings like this without some type of ulterior motive. Verse 9 says, yet here we see the Shunammite's reason for what she was doing. Verse 9 says she perceived he was a holy man of God. She was able to identify the power source operating inside of Elisha, and it caused her to want to serve him in the way that only she could. Amen. This brings me to my first point. True hospitality flows from God's heart to yours. Amen. It's no secret that true godly character will have blessings chasing you down. That's a fact. The Bible talks about it. But what's notable here is that her extension of kindness was genuine. She didn't do this for town recognition or popularity from her friends. She didn't offer such a gift because it would be seen by the city leaders and she would be acknowledged. She didn't even do it for extra credit from the Lord. She did it because God led her to. It's one thing for someone to do something for you genuinely, but it's another for them to do it out of duty and spite. Listen, if you got to do something for me out of spite or grudgingly, I don't want it. You can keep that. Amen. If it don't come with a Coke and a smile, I don't want it. Amen. The Bible even talks about this. In 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, it says, Each of you should give what you have decided, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but for God loves a cheerful yeah. Uh huh. You see, conventional hospitality, the ones we usually see on TV and out publicly, the easy scene, applause-driven hospitality, it welcomes to its table the respectable only. Those deemed in our social settings and our circles as worthy of the gift, like the pastors of the church, the supervisors on your job, the nice neighbor with the cute yard, the popular kid in class, it's quite easy to offer your kindness and generosity to these people. Mm -hmm. We unfortunately see this all too often. The bigger the title or even anointing, the bigger the volunteer list to serve. I said it. But genuine hospitality, as in the case before us, looks out for the poor and deserving, the culturally deemed unpleasant, the worker bees, the unwed mothers looking for acceptance, the ex-addicts still finding their way, those not on your level of anointing, the heavy-hearted, or the ones that you say, oh, they stress me out too much, they got too much going on. God is looking for hospitality for these people. Genuine hospitality looks out for the poor and the deserving. Amen. And invites them to be fed. 
Her level of commitment to the man of God started with providing his mere visitation. Yeah. Let's think about this for a minute. In the Old Testament, the prophets represented the mouthpieces of God. Yeah. They were chosen and charged to carry out the works of the Lord. They walked with God in such a way that his presence was with them. Amen. As vessels of God, where the prophet went, so did the presence and authority of God. So as Elisha went, so did the Lord. As she created a place for the prophet to dine and for the Lord to visit, it just wasn't enough. Amen. She wasn't satisfied. When she invited Elisha in, she was inviting the Lord too. When the visitation alone wasn't enough, she decided to create a space for him to now dwell with her. She went from visitation to habitation. It wasn't enough just for a time to time visit to be in his presence every now and then. When I say my prayers at night or at dinner time when I say grace, it wasn't even enough to only get him on Sunday mornings. She needed more. Mm -hmm. See, in the room that she had set up for the man of God, she did it in such a way that served him best. She didn't put her favorite stuff in there. She didn't put her favorite trinkets and the cute curtains. She was like, oh, that's going to be cute, isn't it? No, she didn't do that. She didn't do none of that. According to theologians, the room led into the court and inner apartments and was extremely secluded. It was a secret chamber. This dwelling was then furnished strategically with a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick, as stated in verse 10. This wasn't just sleeping quarters for him, but a room designed for reading, studying, and further develop, developing his ministry. Amen. See, she didn't just accommodate for his natural needs, but his spiritual ones too. Amen. The setup was to cultivate spiritual thoughtfulness and devotion. Amen. My second point, where's your room? Uh -oh. And what does it look like? Wow. Uh -oh. I, I, I like to be honest, my room has been cluttered. Yes. Yes. My room has had stuff in it that don't belong there because this is the room for the Lord. Inside my heart, my room has been, and my husband and I, it's funny, we talked about this. Our biggest lesson in this season and our struggle is our time. Mm -hmm. Work is taking off. Ministry, you're busy. When do you set aside that time to go in the room? and allow him to just be there. So as I'm talking to you, please believe this is for me too. Amen. So Elisha leaves and returns to find his quarters all prepared. He had his own personalized BNB. So once there, him and his servant Gehazi, from now on we're going to call him Hazi the Hater because I think he's black too. And I also think dude is tripping, okay? That's where they would stay, though. So, see, when you sincerely offer yourself to the Lord, he won't forget it. When you give unto the Lord, he tends to pay you back way more than you can ever imagine. And we're going to find out why. Elisha asked Gehazi, man, bring her in. Tell her, come on in, right? So, Elisha says, you have been so gracious. Your heart is so warm. You're so welcoming. You've blessed us so much. What you need? He did. Just, you know. I feel like these people in the Bible are black. Like, I'm sorry. No offense. Baby daddy, but I feel like it's some black people. Right? Okay. He said, what do you need? I can put in a word with the king. You know, I just defeated a whole bunch of other kings for them. I can put in a word for you. Or I can put in a word for the captain of the army. What you need? Talk to me. So her response was, I dwell among my own people. I'm good. <laughs> so Elisha is now confused. He's like, well, what in the world? Enter Kazi the hair. Since Elijah is stumped, he sends her off. He's like, okay, no, no problem. We'll figure this out. So then he inquires of Hazi. Hey, look, <clears throat> tell me what you think. You know, what do you think she need? And this is his response, right? He said, hey, look, she ain't got no kids. And her dude, oh, for real. <laughs> that's how I read it. Like, that's what it says. Her husband, oh, and she ain't got no kids. Behind it, okay? The fact is, his assessment was spot on. We've got to be careful when we dismiss when we consider our opponents or our haters because God can use them too. Hazi might have thrown extra. 
extra salt on the fact her guy was old, but it was true. And secretly, she wanted a baby. See, back in those days, you gotta remember, if you didn't have a child, something was wrong with you. You weren't looked in society as blessed or God be with you. Something was wrong. Here I am, I got too many kids, and everybody looking at me like, something is wrong. <laughs> Times have changed, have <laughs> So check her response. This woman is black. So Elisha questions her, can't get an answer, sends her off. Hazi then comes in with, hey, you know her dude, oh. So then he says, we'll call her back in. Verse 16 says, and he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son, not just a kid, but a son. If you had a son, he was like double blessed. Like your wounds was like golden if you was able to produce a boy. So she said, he said, about this time next year, you're going to have a son. Now check her response, watch this. She said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thy handmaid. In other words, no, don't be lying to me. Who told you to tell me? Like this is, a, who tells a prophet nay? Like in the Bible, nay is no. And she had her hand up. You know she did. No. Don't know how y'all get when somebody tells you something that you don't want to hear. Come on, y'all know. Stop being fake. She said it with attitude, and I told you she black. Nay, my lord, thou man of God, but then she's gonna try and clean it up. Thou man of God, like you just dog dude, disrespectfully, then. <laughs> thy man of God, do not lie unto your handmaid. Elisha's word aroused the deepest grief of her life, though. Her response is indicative of a, a deep pain that was unspoken. She had put this dream of a son to rest many and many years earlier. And this was a reminder of what she didn't have. It's as if she said, how could you be so cruel to awaken my pain? What you say isn't even possible but anymore. Why would you do this to me? See, the problem is our first response to promises of God is doubt because of history of successfully losing. Come on, y'all know what it is. The doctors say, oh no, it can't happen. My bank account say, no, it ain't gonna happen. I'm too old for it to happen. My education says I'm not qualified for it to happen. Shoot, my attitude keeps it from happening. My friends distract it from happening. My unbelief doesn't activate it to happen. It's not possible anymore. How many of y'all said that? Mm -hmm. My season, you know, this ain't my season no more for that. We love to use the seasons. That's enough. See, unbelief questions the truth of God. And it says, this is a new thing, it cannot be true. This is a sudden thing, it can't be true. There's no way to accomplish this. There's only one way God can work. Or even if God does something, it won't be enough. Ask your neighbor, what has unbelief spoken to you? I expect you to answer though if you get a chance. So find your neighbor, come on. Stop being bougie, get your neighbor. Front row ain't saying nothing to each other. <sighs> mm. Thus the Almighty himself acknowledged the hospitality which the woman had shown. Remember, this only came about because she opened her doors. And to his faithful prophet and the promise that was once proclaimed is now present. She had a baby, y'all. Life is good, and until that, everything is great. So a winning see, that's my Wednesday. Y'all all sing that song, that's my Wednesday. You sing it, see, I know. I see you sing it. Life is good until that losing thing catches back up come to on, you. Come on, come on. That's our fear. That this season is too good to be true. That somehow it's going to end soon. There's no reason to get too excited about it because sooner or later, something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to a lad, carry him to his mother. Time out. Fathers. Or excuse me, mothers. Every time something wrong with a kid, what they say? Go see your mama. <laughs> Go ask your mama. 
I don't know who I talk to anymore. He black. I told y'all, they black. It's a black family. <laughs> 20. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then he died. Promise over. Losing season. Back here. See, at this point, many of us are devastated. That pain of losing has found its way back, and it burns. The truth is, at this point, the little faith we did have is gone. The agony of something you so loved and secretly desired so deeply has been taken away. Just like that. Yet our Shunammite woman does something extraordinary. Verse 21. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. And shut the door upon him and went out. Y'all about to shout. Y'all ready? Okay. Why is this important? See, she could have taken her son to another room. This is a, a huge compound. She got like a resort type style. So she could have put him anywhere. She could have took him to his room or another room on the property to prepare for his transition to death. But what did she do? She laid him on the bed of the man of God. Why? In other words, she took him to the room where God dwelled. She rested him on the resting space of the man of God who carried the presence of the Lord with him. So instead of preparing for the boy's, the boy's burial, she prepared him for his resurrection. Hallelujah. See, what are you shot I got today so enjoy it <laughs> verse 22 and she called unto her husband and said send me I pray thee one of the young men and one of the, the donkeys I can't say that word that I may run to the man of God and come again and he said wherefore wilt thou go to him today it is neither new moon nor Sabbath and she said it is well okay let me just say come on, come on. don't <laughs> Why are you asking all these questions? I didn't ask you. When I come to you and I say I need your help, I didn't ask for all these other stuff. Okay, just do what I asked you to do. But instead, like a husband, right. bless you, right. blessings. <laughs> he said, why are you going to church? It ain't Sunday. What you need to go see the pastor for? What's wrong with you? Come on. Come on. This leads me to point number three. Sometimes even those close to you won't understand how you got to move in this season. Yeah. 